I came to India uh, in 19, early 1941, 40s. And I stayed there until about 48. And that was the eight years of my building, both the education, middle, uh, the high school education and the university education. I traveled from there then on an Indian passport to the United States to do my studies there. Now, what I find uh, that hundreds of African students have gone to India and studied there. And I think that in Kenya, number of, I think there are always some two, 3,000 people, maybe sometimes at times there used to be 4,000 plus students studying in India. Uh, and the biggest complaint that we keep on getting over there is always that do they fit in to our society? As we go, and I remember specifically uh, my own experience, that when I went to the United States, and I ended up in, after first year, I went to the south of the, uh, I think it was Missouri or Tennessee, I can't remember. But I went over there and they told us that, sorry, I will not be able to serve you in a restaurant. Uh, then they took us inside where there were all the filth, you know, all over the place and said, we'll make some table for you over here and you can eat over here. And I told him that, I'm sorry, uh, I will certainly call the Indian High Commission or Indian Embassy at that particular time, Washington, I'll alert them that this is not on. The question is that the that there is always a segregation, whether it is from Indian side or from the African side. But there is always a continuous segregation, unless and until you are born over there, brought up over there, you become a part of a society. Then nobody really bothers about it. Like in Jamnagar, where I studied my first four years, there were whole cities. There's a whole community of cities. And they all come from overseas, from Africa, and they turn into, they can speak fluent Gujarati, they can speak fluent discussion. Their, their lifestyle was completely like us. You go to Janjira, you find the same thing. The question is that the integration and diaspora, if you call a diaspora who are not considered to be the citizens of those countries anymore now, they are still an outsider, then one can understand. But once you are a part and parcel of that, then it is very difficult. Like me, being in, born in, in, in Africa 92 years back, if, if I find segregation against me, then I find it extremely difficult to accept it because it's not a possibility. The question is that how does the how does how do we create if the Indians wants the respect wherever they go, then we must also make very sure that the people who are not looking like us, who are not from our country, but they are temporary who had come down over here for education, for some businesses, for some training that we should be looking at them in that particular manner. I think there's a huge change possible. Number two is that the high commissions and the embassies wherever in Africa of Indian high commissions and embassies must also try to look at all those guys. And I'm sure that uh, Mr. Uh, um, high Commissioner, you'll remember that in your uh, compound at the days of good days of uh, um, whether there was an Independence Day, uh, you, you would have a number of African students who has already gone there and come back and are in good positions to be over there. And many a times I've seen in your, in, in your embassy, wherever I come down for dinner, that we have seen lots of people of African origin coming over there and, paying, uh, and being, being a party to it. So the first biggest problem that we've got to find out is that are we prepared as an in India to accept Africans or other communities which are there temporarily? There might be three years, maybe five years, maybe six years, maybe 10 days. Are we prepared to accept them just because they don't look like us? They do not speak our language. 
that there that there could be uh, that 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 there is a, a segregation against them. To to me, if we can solve that issue, then I think uh, we can solve uh, quite a bit. For example, the present uh, um, uh, wife of the president of Kenyatta, uh, Uru Kenyatta's wife, Margaret. His father was being sent uh, on our scholarship to India to study. He studied. He became in a, in a good position. He became the ultimately a general manager uh, of the Kenya Railways. The point is that now, every time there was a vacation, they did not know what to do. But we made very sure that he came down to our homes and stayed with us and stayed with our families, whether we were there or not, but they stayed with our families. So the relationships were built to an extent that they accepted each other in a very well way. Uh, I still remember that one day he was one on one of our boards. And so when we went to India, he told my wife, Aruna, I'd like to buy a sari for you. Aruna said, no, come on now, you don't have to buy a sari. I'm okay, there's not a necessity. He said, listen, I stayed in your home for months and I consider you to be my sister. And you are now telling me that I can't take by your sari. I, I don't want to listen to any other arguments. Just tell me what you like, because if I buy something and you don't like, it will not be right. So just tell me what you like. Here are the saris which are shown here. You decide. The point is that the, it can only open up, provided we are prepared to accept them. And for India today, Africa is the largest, one of the largest markets, availability for goods and services. So I think that there is a need to some change of attitudes and basically at an educational level, that just people don't look like you, that doesn't mean that you don't like them and you should not give them the proper. So I think that's one particular part which you said that many times has not been spoken, but I thought, let me speak today, that that attitude of not being wanted in a country is not acceptable. It, there, there and then, then we will always fall short and back in our ambition to build uh, our, our country and build our name as, as a good people of India.